Hi everyone, I'm gonna be going live this morning, or actually I should say this afternoon, with Dr. Blake Evans. He wrote a paper, COVID-19 Vaccine and Infertility Baseless Claims and Unfounded Social Media Panic. So we're gonna talk all about vaccines and the baseless claims, and we're gonna do a whole bunch of myth busting this afternoon. I have Dr. Blake Evans that's gonna be joining me here in a second. And he is one of the many experts who wrote this paper. And so I'm very excited to have him join us today. And he's gonna be talking about whether you should be getting the vaccine in pregnancy, if you should be worried about your fertility, if it causes miscarriages, if you should not get it if you're breastfeeding. And of course, we'll have him on here in a second to talk about the science and to do not just a little bit of myth busting, but a whole lot of myth busting. So I'm gonna bring Dr. Blake Evans on right now. Let me see if I can grab him. Right up. Um, so I've heard a lot of people, they've been asking me questions. Hi, Dr. Evans, thanks for joining us. You guys, this is Dr. Blake Evans. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from. Yeah, hi, thanks for having me here today. Um, so I'm a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist currently working at the University of Oklahoma. I grew up in Oklahoma and just recently finished my fellowship training um, last year, I guess I can say last year now that we're finally out of 2020 um, at the National Institutes of Health. And so happy to be here today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So you wrote this paper, COVID-19 Vaccine and Infertility, Baseless Claims and Unfounded Social Media Panic. Why did you write it? I wrote this paper because uh, I feel like a lot of it is within the title. It was um, so there was just this fire going around lately on social media uh, and also in my patients in the clinic that were extremely concerned about a claim that they had heard that the vaccine leads to sterility is actually what the, the initial claim said. Um, and so this was completely baseless. There's no evidence behind it. Um, it was put on a blog that has since then been taken down because of its um, you know, non-reliable uh, information that it had. Um, but these were two physicians or two doctors that had made this claim that the vaccine could lead to sterility. And so um, prompted by this and the widespread panic in all of our patients, I wanted to get to the bottom of it, see if there was any evidence. And if there is evidence, then I obviously needed to put out some information to provide to our patients. So so what was the base for this claim that was in this article? And you've done some research to show how it's completely baseless. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? So the claim was made because there is a protein in the human placenta called syncytin-1. And the, um, the claim was made by this uh, physician that previously worked with Pfizer several years ago. And whether or not there was ulterior motives to make such a claim, I, I have no idea. But... Um, the, the protein in the human placenta is, uh, was stated to be similar in structure to the spike protein that is inside of the COVID vaccine. So their claim was if we are giving ourselves a vaccine or receiving a vaccine, making an antibody to a protein that's the spike protein, well, it also is going to attack the human placenta and leads to sterilization, which is just absolutely not true. And it was completely baseless and rightfully so has created an absolute uproar in our patients with concern. So, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, you, you. Um, so in our, in our article, um, one of the physicians that collaborated with me had um, basically taken the amino acid sequence of syncytin-1, the human uh, placental protein, and compared it to the SARS-CoV-2 surface glycoprotein, also known as the spike protein, and the, there's basically, there was no significant similarities in the structure whatsoever. So there's no homology. And therefore to presume that an antibody would be made against the spike protein, but also be attacking or, going, or fighting against the, the protein in the placenta is just, um, it's irresponsible to say and not true. And what is the evidence that COVID-19 vaccine will not reduce or affect one's fertility? There is no evidence. No, 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 no. It will not reduce fertility. There is evidence. I mean, they did animal studies. 
Oh, I apologize. Yes. Sorry. My, I got a new puppy and she happened to just bark right when you said that. I apologize. You probably can hear that in the background. She's a French bulldog. Very cute. But <laughs> so, yes, there are. Um, so in regards to the current evidence, there are, there are animal studies and they actually, the, and rats is what they have done this. And, um, and there was no indication that it led to infertility or miscarriage, for example. Um, there are, although women were not enrolled in the trials, the Pfizer and Moderna trials that were pregnant, there were women who ultimately became pregnant. Um, there was about 23 in the Pfizer study and 12 or 13, I think, in the Moderna study. There's one patient in each of the studies that had a miscarriage, but they were in the placebo arm, so they did not receive the vaccine. Um, but in addition to that, uh, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, as well as several other women's health societies, ACOG and Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine, have all put forth statements saying that because there is no live viral particles in the vaccine, it is mRNA, um, there is no belief that would lead to an increase in uh, infertility or miscarriage or congenital anomalies also. Right. That's a big concern too. What yeah. about for breastfeeding mothers? What should they know about the vaccine? Should they not get it? Should they get it? Uh, the same societies also say that women who are breastfeeding should also not have the vaccine withheld from them um, and, and should get it if they want to get the vaccine. Despite everything that you're saying, I mean, despite all your degrees, you went to, you know, you did your fellowship at the NIH, you're, you know, you work at a university center, you teach medical students, you teach residents and fellows, there's still going to be a healthy amount of skepticism out there, despite mm -hmm. all the research. So how do you handle that as a physician? How do you talk to your patients when you have someone that isn't quite convinced by what you're sharing with them? Yeah. What, what, how do you respond to that? So well, first off, um, that's a very reasonable thing for someone to be skeptical. I mean, the COVID itself, just the virus is relatively new. The vaccine was produced uh, very quickly at an unprecedented speed because of the dire urgency for the vaccine. But um, I am 1 million percent understandable if a patient is reluctant to get the vaccine or a little bit skeptical. Um, but it is uh, as physicians, as healthcare providers, it's our obligation and part of our job to provide the uh, provide evidence for our patients, the safest evidence, and give opinions on what we think is best for our patients. And so while I'm entire, I will always respect patient autonomy, and I want a patient to uh, make this decision for herself. And this is ultimately a patient is going to, that'll be their decision to make whether or not they get the vaccine. But as long as they're understanding that um, the risk versus benefits of getting the vaccine um, we do know that women who get pregnant and contract COVID do have an increased risk of being admitted to the intensive care unit, uh, mechanical ventilation, so having a, a tube down their throat to help them breathe, and also an increased risk of death. And so for a woman to contract COVID and be at increased risk of those things uh, whenever they're pregnant, um, considering that to the theoretical risk of the vaccine, um, and we know that these huge trials by Pfizer and Moderna that were very well orchestrated and done had a, 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 just a great safety profile. So knowing all those things and um, taking that into consideration with all of our women's health societies that I mentioned earlier, ASRM, ACOG, SMFM, um, I, I would hope to convince the patient that, that it is safe to get the vaccine and there's just no evidence that it causes infertility or increased risk of miscarriage. Beautiful. Thank you for that. So let's just do some quick myth busting before we end this. And, and thank you for your time on this Sunday. I know how you know busy you are and I see you're in your scrubs. So I know you're, you're still working. Um, here we go. Uh, true or false, COVID-19 can reduce fertility in young women. False. Okay. Um, there, uh, true or false, there is no evidence that COVID-19 vaccine will not reduce fertility. I might be tricking you there. I'm not trying to, I promise. <laughs> double, double. So, so there's, there's no evidence that it leads to decreased fertility, is that what you're saying? Yeah. True, yes, there, that's correct. There's no evidence that the vaccine leads to decreased fertility. Okay, good. I think I'm confusing myself there. Okay, um, true or false, the government, the government is telling people who are trying to conceive or pregnant not or trying to conceive not to get the vaccine for at least a few months before, before they try? No, that's false. Okay. 
Um, true or false, if I'm breastfeeding, I should not get the vaccine. And that is also false. Okay. Um, I was going to say something funny, but there's nothing funny about COVID <laughs> or anything like that. Right. So I know we're smiling and, you know, we're, we, you know, we, we like to have these conversations together, but I don't want anyone to take that as, uh, as, as us not taking this seriously at all. So I tell my patients, I advise them to get the vaccine when they can. I feel the benefits far outweigh any of the potential minimal side effects. And it's far more dangerous for a pregnant woman to get COVID and possibly be on a ventilator than it is to get the vaccine based on everything we know right now. And it sounds like you tell your patients the same thing. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And last fertility or last COVID vaccine uh, myth that I want to bust that, um, or just COVID myth is that COVID is not a big deal in pregnancy. It is a very big deal in pregnancy. Yeah, it's, it's very dangerous. Uh, it's, you know, and, and kind of uh, not to compare, um, you know, flu to COVID, but, you know, respiratory issues such as the flu, we, we definitely know that that increases risk in pregnant women. And we, we were also seeing this in COVID-19 as well, that women who are pregnant who contract it, as I mentioned previously, have increased risks such as ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and death. So um, it is something to be taken seriously, um, especially people who are getting the vaccine right now or being offered it right now are the patients who are likely high risk of contracting COVID. So um, when whenever this message is conveyed that um, all of the women's health societies advocate for them to get the vaccine. It's usually a sign of relief or, or like, oh yeah, I thought I'd heard this online or from someone that it's dangerous to get, but they really, you know, they don't, they haven't really talked with their doctor about it or really looked into it. And so whenever we convey this message to them, then they usually, or a lot of times are open to getting the vaccine. But uh, once again, I still want to stress that it's the patient's decision. It's, you know, ultimately if they want to get the vaccine, then they, they should be able to get the vaccine. But um, hopefully all of this information we're discussing today will give them some reassurance um, that we're in their corner and, and advocating for them. Yeah, and I advocate regardless of where you are during your treatment to get the vaccine as soon as you have it available to you. Do you, yeah. is that similar to what, what you say or what kind of position do you have on that? Yeah, um, you know, whether they're undergoing fertility treatments or getting ready to start IVF, they just started IVF, they're doing IUIs next month, or, you know, they're just talking about getting pregnant the next few months, like, regardless of the scenario, I just say, hey, if it's available to you, then, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't not get it because of what you've heard, you know, this is what we know, this is the current evidence, this is what all of our women's health societies are saying. Um, whether you're trying to conceive pregnant or breastfeeding. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah, I'm trying to encourage women to strongly consider, especially women who have embryos frozen that are planning a frozen embryo transfer, maybe to wait until they actually get the vaccine first and then to transfer um, mm -hmm. so that it, for women who obviously have, uh, are nervous about getting it in pregnancy, especially in the beginning part, to just delay things a few months here until you can get the vaccine first. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing too, that I've heard a lot of is um, I'll have patients referred to me and they'll say, oh, my OBGYN told me that um, they're okay with me getting it, but not until after the first trimester. And I, I don't know of any evidence that maybe you do, but I, that's just not what I'm hearing from ACOG, ASRM, SMFM. So that, that is something to, if a patient, like, for example, this patient, uh, or if a patient works in the hospital and they were told not to get until after first trimester, well, then there's, 12 plus weeks that you're exposed to COVID and you could have gotten it, you know, uh, several weeks ago and had this immunity built up. Like if you're working in the ICU as a physician and you're pregnant. So um, I don't know of any evidence to suggest that it would increase the risk of congenital anomalies. And that's opposite of what ASRM is saying. So I, I definitely don't think those patients should, should wait until past the first trimester. So Right. I think in the beginning, I was actually saying that because I was worried about, you know, you hear those rumors about people getting fevers after the vaccine, but mm -hmm. I haven't, now that I've seen people who've had it, I've had it, I, I don't really see that temperature rise that, that, that I heard could happen. And I was concerned, you know, um, that maybe that could be a teratogen that, you know, some sort of fever in the first trimester, but now I'm not concerned about that. Right. Yeah, and that's, that was also on one of the ASRM documents that they released about FAQs. Um, 
I believe you can actually Google it and just pull it up. I, since obviously we're members to ASRM, I don't know if that changes if someone just were to Google it. But I know one of the FAQs was, mm -hmm. um, I got the vaccine, I got a fever, should I be at risk for or be worried about neural tube defects? And they specifically addressed that if you're taking the recommended prenatal vitamin or daily amount of folic acid that, uh, that is recommended, then there shouldn't be an increased risk for that. That's great. That's really good information for everybody to hear. Okay. Well, thank you again. We appreciate you. Thank you for all your work. This is a really important article. I think you're going to change the hearts and minds of a lot of people who had a healthy amount of skepticism after doing their online research that seems really, really convincing. And so I really appreciate you writing this article. For those of you guys who want to read it, it's COVID-19 Vaccine and Infertility, Baseless Claims and Unfounded Social Media Panic. Thank you, Blake. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. See you guys all later. Bye-bye.